Welcome to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, a bi-weekly look at all things related to the growing elite clubs nationally, the ECNL. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. Now, here's your host for Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, former U.S. soccer press officer and longtime soccer broadcaster, Dean Linke. Episode two of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, Dean Linke with ECNL's president and CEO, Christian Labors. Christian, you know the deal. Set the table for today's show. Thanks, Dean. I thought the first show was fantastic. So thanks for your leadership and putting this all together and getting us moving. Today, we have another great episode, I think, starting off with Mike Cullina, a guy with as many hats as you could possibly wear, U.S. soccer board member, U.S. club soccer chairman of the board, VDA executive director and president of the Virginia Premier League, which is also an ECNL regional league. So Mike's going to give us a whole bunch of perspective about the youth soccer landscape now, his club's decisions over the past couple of years and some other topics. After that, we're going to go to Holly Schumacher and Amy Bracken, who both work for Hyperquake in Cincinnati. And that's the organization that led ECNL through the new brand identity and discovering what our identity should be and the research that went into that. And then the launch of the new identity last week, which we're really, really excited about. So they'll talk a little bit about the marketing and branding concepts that went into that and maybe some things that clubs can consider as they look at their own branding work. And then obviously uh, you finished with a great interview with John Bradford from NCFC, a guy working at USL in multiple levels and then overseeing youth development in, in one of the biggest clubs, if not the biggest club in the country. So a fantastic show all in all. So the table is set. We'll return with our visit with Mike Cullina after this message from the ECNL. With over 200 clubs and nearly 50,000 players, the ECNL is leading youth soccer forward in the United States. A new season has kicked off and a new brand identity has been launched, but one thing stays constant. The ECNL is more than a league. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Dean Linke along with the CEO of ECNL and President Christian Labors. And our first guest is Mike Cullina. Check out this guy. He's on the U.S. Soccer Board of Directors. He's the at-large rep. He's the chairman of the board for U.S. Club. He's the Prince William Soccer Executive Director, the VDA Executive Director, and he's the president of the Virginia Premier Soccer League. Christian, you always pick these fine gentlemen with more than five titles. You know what? And they're always from Virginia. So I don't know what that says about the state of Virginia, but we've had some people with a lot of responsibility. All right, well, let's dive right in, Christian. I'll let you lead the conversation with Mike, and I'm looking forward to spending time with him. Awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for being on. Obviously, you have not only a group of titles now, but a long sort of path to get to this point. I mean, I remember when we first met, you were coaching at Ohio Elite in the uh, Boys DA, and I was at FC Milwaukee in the Boys DA in Mid-American Conference games. But obviously, you've had a lot of paths, a lot of stops along the way since then. Maybe give us a little quick history lesson on where you came from to get to the positions you are today. Yeah, thanks, guys, for having me. Look forward to, to the conversation. Father was in the military, went to high school in Germany, ended up in Kansas at a small school playing ball, got a job coaching college straight out of college, ironically enough, and then weaved my way through the Midwest, spending some time as a state director of coaching in Nebraska, and then where we linked up, Christian, when I moved to Cincinnati, I think probably 13, 14 years on the ODP regional staff. And then we moved our family here to Northern Virginia, which is where my parents had relocated after I graduated high school. So we moved here to be closer to our family and somehow along the way picked up a number of responsibilities for whatever reason. So that's a, the Cliff Notes version of how we got to where we are today. So... Obviously, uh, there's not a lot of people that have uh, been state DOCs and then have moved into leadership roles in U.S. club soccer. That's sort of been a political firewall, probably, that has been difficult to pass. You're the chairman now of U.S. club for uh, a couple of years now. Maybe give everybody some insight on how that came about and what your role is at U.S. club. Here at Prince William, when we went into the DA, we were forced to leave 
another league. And so when we got together with other clubs and went to the Virginia Premier League, we decided, you know, as a league, we wanted to get some representation on the U.S. club soccer board. At that time, the NPLs were newer and that whole platform was expanding. And we were fortunate to have an opportunity to join the platform as a league. So I worked with some of our club partners in the league to get enough votes to get on the board. Through that process, then when it was time for a new chair at U.S. Club Soccer, several of the members came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in doing it. Talked to my wife first, which was the smart play, got her signed in, and then came to me and here I am. So it really was a collective group with the board at U.S. Club Soccer to become the chair. As always, a lot of those uh, positions have a lot of work and not always a lot of uh, reward to them. So I know a lot of people at U.S. Club are appreciative of your leadership. You mentioned Prince William, BDA, and the DA, and probably not a lot of people know that Virginia Development Academy was actually the first club to choose to join the ECNL and leave the girls' DA several years ago in what became a prescient decision with the avalanche of clubs that followed. So maybe talk us through that decision, because at the time it wasn't exactly the clear thing that was happening nationally, but you guys took the first step to say the ECNL was a spot for your girls program. I think we've learned a lot just in anything over time about what's important to you. And sometimes we chase the wrong things. Our time in the DA and and on the boys DA, we, we were in until the end. We found it to be extremely rewarding. We had no animus, if you will, toward the academy. It just was a decision that we had to make. And I pretty quickly realized in that first year that for our membership, it just wasn't the right pathway. And some of the restrictions that were there were just things that our membership weren't responding to in a positive way. And and the question is, well, do you work hard to change your culture into somebody else's mindset, or do you adapt and understand your membership and provide them with a platform that makes sense? And here in Northern Virginia, for us, it became pretty clear early on that things weren't as we wanted them to be. So yeah, we played a little bit of poker here. And first time I brought it up with staff, it thought I was nuts, obviously. And this wasn't a, a U.S. club play, a chairman play at all. This was Prince William Soccer and BDA. That is my job. That is where my passion is. Not that it isn't in the other places, but having a chance to work with the players and the staff every day, that's what I wake up excited to do. So we were clearly just looking at decisions that were best for our membership, taking all the politics aside. And interestingly enough, I think when I joined the U.S. Soccer Board, there was a huge rumor through the club, oh, now we're going back to the DA. I said, no, these are all separate decisions. So essentially what we did is throughout the fall season, we evaluated where we were as a club, We had taken a significant leap forward in terms of the competition level and candidly where we were as a staff and where we were as a club in being able to compete at that level. But we knew that the long term of the the quality of our membership, the quality people that we have in the club, that we could compete at any level in the country. It would just take time to get there. And we would really have to focus on our own education. So Throughout the fall, it just was an evaluation process, and we didn't have any guarantees that we were obviously getting into the the ECNL, but we did kind of play the game and knowing that, as Jay said last week on the podcast, being first to anything is, is always good. And as I explained to our staff, we have an opportunity now potentially to make a decision and control the outcome of that decision, but we won't control the next one. And so if we choose to leave the DA and find that that's the wrong decision for our membership, probably weren't welcoming us back with with open arms. If we choose to stay in the academy, and then what ultimately happened in the onflood of, of clubs that wanted to leave, we may not have as much input on that decision either because there was a number of traditionally very strong and very well-respected clubs. And it's a numbers game of how many clubs can be in a given league. So ultimately what we did is we put together a parent committee with representatives from all three clubs, our partner club, Virginia Soccer Academy, Prince William Soccer, and then VDA. Every team was represented, boys and girls side. At that time, we just had the four girls teams and the six boys teams. And we just did an exercise on what's important to us and never mentioning 
the DA or ECNL. We simply just spoke about what was important to our membership. And at the end, as the parents were sharing the thoughts and ideas on a various list of topics that we had asked them to consider and provide feedback for, one of the parents raised their hand and said, why are we in the DA when our values align with the ECNL? And I just smiled and ended the meeting. And uh, the application had already been written, quite frankly, and was sent in the next morning. So we wanted to ensure that it was what our membership desired. And, and that, so that's, that's what came to pass. We were never involved in the conversations with the groups of clubs that made decisions to go. We just made a choice for us. And ultimately, it turns out we made the right decision for a number of reasons. But that was our process. We're glad to have you in, in that discussion. Also, you, you mentioned your last role, which is your most recent role. And uh, Dan, you may have some thoughts on this as well, but obviously you joined the U.S. Soccer Board of Directors about uh, a year ago, maybe a little longer than that. And that obviously has opened up a whole new set of discussions and issues that I'm sure uh, our, our listeners would be very interested in. Well, for sure. I mean, we're, we're involved in, in conversations and had been. Obviously, it's different now in, in the COVID era and, and once the decision to close the DA was was made, but there's a lot of conversations about how we move the youth game forward, for sure. Yeah, with that, obviously you have a front row seat in your role on the U.S. Soccer Board of Directors, as Christian just mentioned. Uh, with that crystal ball out, Mike, as you know, I love to have that crystal ball. What do you see the Federation's role in youth soccer for the future? Education, a more appropriate and streamlined identification process for our youth national teams with more inclusion across the country, regardless of what competition platform you're in. I think it's a, a country our size is very difficult to control the top end or any piece of the development pathway. But what we can do is educate and what we can do is, is create a more appropriate understanding of how players develop, what clubs can be doing on a, a day in and day out basis to help the development of the top players. I think it is certainly much more complicated than what patches on the sleeve or what league a player is, is in on the weekend. Development isn't linear, for sure. If there was a magic equation to develop the top players in the world, we would have done it already. The more we can open up education, the more we can provide access to, to education, not just within the Federation, but within U.S. Club Soccer and, and certainly the other member organizations as well, to educate coaches, educate players, educate parents on the appropriate pathways in what does an appropriate environment look like. I think U.S. Club and, and Ashley Larry with, with Kevin Payne's guidance have done a tremendous job with the Players First platform. And I think more of that and less of trying to tell clubs what to do and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it would be certainly a better path forward for this sport. I mean, you sit in a, you know, in the middle of a political crossroads and for those who know you, they probably uh, know that you kind of enjoy that. But so in, when you look at a, you know, the perspective from a board member of, of U.S. soccer and a chairman of U.S. club and, and, the, and the differences and challenges that go on between leagues within U.S. club, between leagues, U.S. club, U.S. youth, everything else. And then you have your club hat where you have players registered probably in U.S. club and U.S. youth and ECNL and some other stuff. When you look at this landscape of so many different choices and programs, what are your thoughts? As a club, we're going to make a decision that's best for our players. We probably register two and a half to three times as many players in U.S. youth soccer as we do in U.S. club. We were a part of the Boys and Girls DA. We were the only full-time member of boys and girls in Virginia at the time we left on the girls' side because those decisions we felt were best for our members. It certainly is difficult to work within the blurred lines of wearing various hats, but I take the responsibility very seriously when... I am on a committee call with the Federation or in a board meeting with the Federation. I'm wearing a U.S. soccer hat. I want what's best for the sport globally. I want what's best for U.S. soccer. I want to win a men's World Cup. I want to continue to put stars on the women's jersey. I want a robust NWSL. I want USL and MLS to continue to attract the best. You're, you're hitting a lot of talking can. points right there, man. It's I feel true. like you're stump speech right now. When, yeah, well, but when we're with U.S. club, we got to look at what does ID2 look like? How do the leagues work together? ECNL, as you can, as you know, Christian and, and the listeners can imagine, 
isn't always looked favorably even within U.S. club walls. We understand it's the top of the platform. There's no question about that. But how do the NPLs and the Premier Leagues and the ECNLs all work and thrive together? So it's tough, especially on days when I have calls with the various organizations on the same day. You know, I kind of got to step away and get a coffee and reset. But it is a bit of a challenge, and I just have to be honest about where I lie on things. I'm pretty transparent and pretty honest, so those folks know. But people in the Federation know I'm the U.S. club chairman and know I have a club that's in the ECNL. There's nothing hidden there about it. So with that, and knowing that you do, again, wear all those hats, obviously this is Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Mike, just kind of how you feel when you hear ECNL, what it has meant to your club and your players? especially now with us on the boys' side. For BDA, it's the only platform we're in. It's only 12, cl- 12 teams, and we participate exclusively in the ECNL. So having that unified platform, that all-in mentality, is really powerful for us. I think that it, it has allowed our staff to come together and work a little bit even more collaboratively. It's our first core value is collaboration in BDA. And so having both sides now in the ECNL really has been powerful for us. Now, in the COVID era, it's still a little bit of a challenge because our boys don't have the experiences of the showcases. They don't have the experiences of traveling to the Carolinas because we're purely playing a Virginia schedule at the moment, kind of the sleep in your own bed schedule. So the boys don't have the same types of experiences yet that the girls do, but it it, it has allowed us to be a far more unified. And obviously the time away in the spring has given us kind of a head start on making sure that our game models and, and our periodization aligns on both sides, understanding the differences. So as we wrap this up now, Mike, I really appreciate you being here and some of the different perspectives you shared, I think, highlight some of the complications in the youth soccer market. But looking forward, what are you looking forward to most as we get hopefully out of the post-COVID challenges? What are you looking forward to when we resume normal, quote unquote, soccer, hopefully in the next six months or so? I'm really hoping that we take the opportunity we have now to kind of reset what youth soccer looks like. We had gotten a little bit away from understanding the needs of family and a little bit more toward taxing our members with both time and actual money and and, and some of the travel that was associated with the sport. I think we could be much smarter in creating an appropriate development pathway with higher standards. I know ECNL continues to raise the standards and, and I certainly appreciate that, but I do think this is an opportunity to kind of think a little bit differently. I think the showcases, the travel is necessary. We understand it's necessary but it can't be exclusive. So I'm hoping that our new normal looks somewhere in between what it is now and what it was in 2019. We're certainly excited to reminisce on what happened in March and April. And I I think when the books are written about the amount of work, and and certainly Christian, you and I spent a lot of time uh, on the phone together and in different conversations during that time, simply trying to keep the sport alive if nothing else, and understanding when can we get on the field. And the first time we kicked the ball for real in a real live game this fall was was really a moment that you kind of had to take a step back and say, you know, we're really thankful for. But moving forward, we got to think differently. We can't just go back to accumulating Marriott rewards points. We got a little bit out of of control there. So I, I am hopeful that the leadership across all the platforms recognizes that these are families They have certainly want to help their their sons and daughters develop at the highest level, but we don't necessarily have to do it by jumping on airplanes. Mike Cullen, uh, so many titles, U.S. Doctor Board of Directors, Chairman of the Board, U.S. Club, Executive Director for Prince William Soccer, a great club, Executive Director of BDA, and the President of the Virginia Premier Soccer League. Mike, thanks so much for being on Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Mike, for kicking off the show. Coming up next, Christian Labors and I are joined by two of the superstars from Hyperquake that were key in the ECNL rebrand, relaunch of the logo and all of the excitement around ECNL. We hear from Hyperquake, Amy Bracken and Holly Shoemaker after this message. Soccer.com is proud to partner with the ECNL to support the continued development of soccer in the U.S. at the highest levels. We've been delivering quality soccer equipment and apparel to players, fans, and coaches since 1984. 
living and breathing the beautiful game ourselves, our goal at Soccer.com is to inspire you to play better, cheer louder, and have more fun. Visit Soccer.com today to check out our unmatched selection of gear, expert advice, and stories of greatness at every level of the game. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, episode number two, segment number two. Dean Linky back with ECNL president and CEO Christian Lavers. New podcast, new brand, new look. It's all exciting, Christian. You know, the new brand and our new identity is something that we're really proud of. It was the result of a lot of work over a long period of time. And I'm really excited that we have two of the people here that led that process for us. The company that did the work was Hyperquake out of Cincinnati a branding evolution company. And here we have Amy Bracken and Holly Shoemaker, who are gonna talk us through a little bit about what went into this branding project, why we did it, and maybe talk a little bit about the difference between marketing, branding, and other topics. So with that, Amy and Holly, if you could introduce yourselves and your role at Hyperquake, that would help. This is Amy Bracken, and I'm a client director at Hyperquake. I've actually been working with or around the ECNL for the last 10 years, so I've kind of been behind the scenes. And fun fact, I was around to create the original logo, which is near and dear to my heart, but always have felt just like the rest of everyone else at ECNL that it was time to evolve. So when it was time to do that, I was so excited to jump in, knowing that I work for a brand evolution company that we could help them get there. So brought him in, talked to Christian, got him on board. Everybody was excited. It was a really collaborative process and really, really thrilled with the outcome. And I'm Holly Shoemaker, creative director at Hyperquake. And I have been in the creative industry now for 20 plus years. And this was honestly probably my first branding project that I got to work with rebranding a sports club or something as big as this. And I was just super excited because it's something very different. And I love being able to help a brand tell their story and just the heart and the grit and the enthusiasm from this team, from the actual leadership team. It's exciting to be able to like listen and learn and then be able to create and help create the brand, like how they viewed it. Let's let others see through their eyes. Well, thanks guys. I bet that's helpful for your perspective. Obviously you guys are the experts in the area and we came to you guys for a reason. We've been around, the league had been around for over a decade with our original identity and our original brand, but there'd been a ton of changes. First, obviously going and becoming a boys league as well as a girls league and then massive growth in programming and membership and everything else. But maybe as a starting point, and I know this was an educational process for us in the league as well, but maybe if you guys can talk about the difference between marketing and branding, because I think that's important to understand in understanding why we did this project. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that and and Holly, you can too, and a a little bit about our process. I've always said that ECNL is great at marketing, pushing out their message. They deliver on their brand promise every day, but the logo, the visual representation of the brand wasn't keeping pace with where the brand was going. And when it's time to look at branding, marketing is pushing out a message. Branding is pulling people to you and having people gravitate to who you are. You think about a brand as being a person, like Holly said, everyone at the ECNL leadership down understands who the ECNL is, but they had never taken the time to articulate that and to give it a personality and a really foundational strategy to bring that brand to life in a a more modern and involved way that was actually representing who the ECNL was and who they're becoming and how they've evolved and grown. I mean, it's been exponential over the years. It's been exciting to watch. And, and I finally feel like the logo and the brand shows that effort. A lot of times too, when people talk branding and people talk marketing, when you say branding, I think a lot of people, they think of what you see. So the pictures, the logo, things like that. And how Hyperquake believes that a brand comes to life. It's like a person. So when you think about why you love certain brands, why you go out and buy them, it's your emotional side and saying that I love this brand because they say this, their values match my values. And so now I want to either buy them. I want to buy their service. I want to be a part of it. You want to be a part of it. And I think that was the thing with ECNL, like how do we tell your story in a way that other people can see? You know, other people can see, okay, this is what this league is all about. We want to be a part of it. It reflects what I value. And so all of a sudden, a brand becomes something that has a personality. You understand like what they do, what they say. And it's like, it becomes so much more rounded and really kind of brings that to life. Amy, you mentioned that there was a drop the mic moment on this release. Can you walk us through that? 
in our process, it's kind of slow because we do a lot of research and we do a lot of collaboration. And then we start getting going and, and things start coming to life and you see it. ECNL is not alone in this. It's you get to the end and you're like, how are we going to announce it? How are people going to take it? I mean, we love it, but I remember working with the ECNL team and it was, it has to be a mic drop moment because this is such a beloved brand. And when brands change their logos, you guys know this out there in the world, if you're already aligned to that brand and that person, even though the logo may feel old and dated and dusty, when you change that, some people, and, and you probably have heard this from some people that, you know, I miss the old logo. We needed them to, to feel it. To, to feel our excitement in, in announcing that. So the, the video, the one we released with ECNL really needed to just like hammer that home. Like, this is us, this is it. This is where we're headed. And it needed to be that moment where, you know, people watched it, then they watched it again, then they watched it again. And that was the whole point. And I do think it delivered. I love the phrase, allow us to reintroduce ourselves. I thought that was a fantastic start to that branding video, which has had a huge traction on social media and, and viewership. I was surprised at some level when we started this project because it was three or four months of, of work, but the depth of the research that went into identifying who we are as a brand and the interviews that went on with our staff, with directors of coaching across the country, the research in the positioning of the league vis-a-vis -vis other organizations in the space, and even the concept, however strange at first it was, is thinking about your aspirational consumer and who would your brand be if it was walking around and talking. And I say that because those were all things that were surprising and informative for me in the process. Was there stuff that you guys found surprising and interesting as you were going through getting to know the ECNL and getting to know youth soccer specifically in this branding process? Soccer is life in my house. My kids all play it. I'm married to Doug. It's, it is everything we do. And I've always viewed the sport as being simple. It's the beautiful game because it's simple, but the business that runs soccer is wildly complex. <laughs> the machine behind the sport is anything but simple. And that really, even though I thought I knew the industry from youth up to professional, it's, it's not simple. It's pretty complicated. <laughs> so it takes a minute to ramp up to that, to really understand the ins and outs and the workings behind the business of it. It's, it's interesting you say that, Amy, because we have Mike Cullen on this podcast in the first segment, as Dane referenced, and one of the things we talked about with him, there was the complexity of all the different soccer sports. So for those who maybe don't know that, just rewind back to Mike's top. But Holly, what about you? I really do have to echo that. Like I, and I am not, I did not play soccer growing up. I played basketball. So I learned so much about the sport. And I think the whole idea around the complexity, there were moments where I had to really sit online and read and like read it more than once, maybe three or four times. And then I'd have to ask Amy a question. Can you explain this to me? Because what is all this going on? It's so big. But what I love though, is it's so big, but you had like core values that everyone could feel. And so to me, it just felt like it was still a family. And I think that was just for me cool to see within a company. Like you have clubs in Cincinnati, clubs out West, clubs down south but it seemed like everyone like you cared equally about all of them and I think throughout even early on working with you guys and interviewing everyone we really started to see the the passion and the compassion you had for all the different clubs and I think not that that was surprising but I think I was surprised that so much care went into it and so much care went into like the players because I've heard things about club sports that aren't aren't pretty but what I saw was a different side of it, that how much you really did care about the players and the coaches and what you really wanted was the best for both. Wow, I think you nailed it right there because when you're around ECNL, you understand exactly what you mean by that word family. That was spot on. And I liked your honesty as well as you got to know ECNL, Holly. So we'll go back to you as you continue to work in brand evolution right now in just one sentence, when you think about ECNL, what do you think it stands for? I think it is like that relentless pursuit for the love of the game, like always looking to make it better, always looking to elevate it for the coaches, the players, plus their staff internal. So I think that that pursuit is what's going to always make them ahead of the other leagues out there. Amy, same question for you. I 
really left the project feeling the word collaboration from everyone on the team at the ECNL and their internal team. I'm always impressed with all the clubs coming together. You know, you on the field, you're competitors, but off the field, you have the same goal in mind. And that is to be more than a league, to do more for the player, to be part of their life beyond soccer. And I just think what a gift that is in our country to have a league that cares so much about collaboration and, and doing things together for the better good. One of the things that I, I thought was interesting on here, and, and there's obviously parallels between branding in a league and then branding in a soccer club and how that can kind of continue down because you're ultimately talking to a lot of the same people, but was the process of looking at the aspirational consumer. Who is it that we are, are trying to attract and, and serve and meet the needs of? And there were three aspirational consumers that you guys put together the DOC and the, and then the male teenage player and the female teenage player. And the crazy part about that is when, when I saw that information, I knew we were on to something really special because in the DOC, I looked and I said, holy cow, that describes a lot of me, a lot of people I know. And then when you looked at the players, I had images popping up in my head of people saying players that I coached that had said some of the things that were in there in some of the representations of that player, not because they were people you spoke with, but because the research had been done so well that I really felt like I was looking at a description of the kids that are on the field today. So can you guys talk a little bit about what went into creating that aspirational consumer and, and how you put together such an accurate profile of the players and the DOCs? Our discovery process is pretty, and I know like we bring our clients through it so they can really understand why we're doing what we're doing, but the discovery process is really thorough. So we're looking, we're doing desk research. We're looking at some websites like Stylus. We have a subscription to that, but it's talking about value-based insights. So we're, we're kind of getting into the minds of like, how can we get into the minds of people or sports or leagues? And then and we did talk to people, like we talked to so many people within your organization, understanding the athletes, how can we learn more about them? And then I think even just internally within Hyperquake, we have people that were pretty decent, you know, athletes, soccer players in different leagues. And, you know, we started to pick people's brains even outside of this project. But it's really something that we did is we, we listened a lot. So we believe in like really listening, really trying to understand. And through all the interview processes, even though it might've just seemed like, oh, I just talked to him for a half an hour. We were able to get so much information out of everybody that we interviewed in the beginning that helped us build. And it really helped us sort of like, it's like a guiding post, right? We call them aspirational because you should aspire to serve those people. Those are the people you want to aspire to like really serve. And so we definitely even want to make them feel even more of a, like, how do we reach them? How do we continue to reach them years from now? I also think it's a really interesting tool to use. Something that Hyperquake will tell our clients is take those aspirational consumers and bring them into your meetings. Set them down around the table when it's time to review marketing materials or social posts or whatever it is, your marketing calendar, and, and, and sort of remember who you're talking to, who you do serve. Even though they're only on paper, they're actually real people. So just always keeping them in the forefront. And as time goes by, those people will evolve as well as your brand. So it's something to look five or 10 years down the road and, and refresh those consumers, you know, and what are they doing and how are they showing up? They're a really great tool for making sure that your brand is always speaking to the people who are most important to you. One other of the sort of mic drop moments, I think, for our staff internally, because beyond the research you guys did in talking to so many people and then the online research and all the other stuff, was the continued touch points with our staff as we went through the evolution of the, the background discovery, the inspirational pictures and concepts and all that. But when we got to the branding positioning statement, which again, we've been through this so many times, it sticks in my head, but born out of belief in a better way and continued in the relentless pursuit of excellence. But that born out of belief in a better way and that relentless pursuit, I remember when we had that Zoom, and it was sort of an aha moment where everybody said, yes, that's it. And so that positioning statement kind of carries throughout all of our identity, hopefully moving forward. You know, when you look at clubs that are in our league and clubs that are working to impact their communities, how do you put together a, a positioning statement 
that has that type of oomph. Because when we heard that, we said, that's us. That's what we want to be. That's how we want people to look at us. But how did you come to that? Because that wasn't our words. We maybe tweaked some of it, but your words started it. Well, I don't know, Christian. I think a lot of it wasn't maybe your words coming out like out of your mouth at that moment, but it was the collective voice of the people we spoke to. So it was you and Doug and Michael and Jen and Jason and the, the directors of coaching and coaches and players and alumni. Those words were your words. We synthesized them. We brought them together and put it all down on paper, but it was born out of the sentiment of everyone working at DCNL. I'll jump in before Holly and I said, we'd be remiss not to mention the really good work of Michael Joyce, who's yeah. been the girls ECNL marketing manager now for a little over a year. And then Andrea Wheeler, who came on late in the project, but was hired recently as the boys marketing manager. We'd be remiss not to note their major impact in Michael throughout this whole thing. And then both of them in the rollout especially in making that so successful. So go ahead, Holly. Sorry to jump in on that. Oh, no, you're fine. It is everything we learned, everything we uncovered, all of your words. And then you have to, back at the ranch, how hard we push ourselves on these type of statements. I mean, we are, we are noodling on every word. Mm -hmm. And so we're making sure that we feel something before we give it to you. Like, even when we would read it, we'd be like, oh, that sounds, that sounds good. But then we'd find a word in there. I'm like, I don't like that word. So then we'd all, we noodle on a word. That's our goal is to like, when we, we relay this to you and we relay your brand core, you're kind of like, it feels like, how did they say what I was feeling all along? So that's really what we wanted to do is everything that you were saying and feeling, we work really hard to get it to sort of be alive, pen and paper. Yeah, I would say that the strategy is the unsung hero of branding. Without that strategy and that thinking behind, we would never have gotten to something visual uh, the way we did. It's that foundational oh, no. strategy, you know, coming from how you understand your brand to us applying the strategy to the brand, to the brand then coming to life through design. Yeah. So it, it's a process and it takes time, but it was working. Yeah, I totally agree. And sometimes I know like discovery process can feel like it's taking a little bit longer, but it truly makes the actual design work better. Having this solid foundation, it, I don't wanna say it makes design easy, but we already know where we wanna play. Our sandbox is there and we, we already have ideas. And so we are, we're in it. The hardest thing for a designer is when they say, can you make us a logo? And then they say like a couple words and you're going, I could do anything. So right here, we had such a good foundation to play in. I feel like my youngest son, Maxwell, who's 20, said it best when I showed him the new ECNL logo and look, he said, dad, that is popping. And indeed, <laughs> it's popping. With that, we got to be popping. We got to be promoting. If you know anything about me, I'm always about promoting. So let's end with letting everybody know how they learn more about Hyperquake. I would say go to hyperquake.com or call me directly. <laughs> Amy Bracken. <laughs> yep. If you go to hyperquake.com, there's contact us. And I think it's hello at hyperquake. You can get in contact with us. Follow us on Instagram if you want to see all the things that we're putting out there. Perfect. Instagram at hyperquake and it's www.hyperquake.com. Amy, great to be with you. Holly, great to be with you as a fellow Buckeye and a lonely Bengals fan, Amy. I like the fact that you're in Cincinnati and then I grew up in Toledo, Holly. So great to <laughs> always be connected to those from Toledo. We got to claim it. You know, we got to own yeah, it. We got to. All right. Thank you so much for being on Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Thank you. Thanks guys. Outstanding work by Hyperquake led by Amy and Holly. And we're not done yet, folks. Christian Lavers kind enough to let me fly solo with John Bradford. He's the assistant coach for North Carolina FC and USL Championship. More importantly, he's the technical director for NCFC Youth Under 23s, and he also oversees the boys' ECNL program. And of course, the girls' ECNL program is also thriving for NCFC Youth, known as the North Carolina Courage. John Bradford talks ECNL when we return. ECNL is partnering with Puma for the second year, driving sport forward with the leading products and the next generation of pros who wear them. Puma has proven themselves as the fastest sports brand in the world, the fastest innovation, the fastest players, and the fastest products in the game. They're the perfect partner to complement the speed and talent of our teams. 
In keeping with their mantra of forever faster, Puma introduces the world's fastest boot, the Ultra. The only boot engineered for speed, the Ultra combines a woven upper with a lightweight outsole for direct forward motion, speed, and acceleration. It's the best in the game, designed for the best players in the game. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Dean Linky flying solo because we've got the perfect guest here, John Bradford, who is the assistant coach for North Carolina FC and USL Championship. He's also the technical director for NCFC U23, which is USL2, and he's the Academy Boys director for NCFC Youth, arguably the biggest club in North America. John Bradford joins me now. John, thanks for being with me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Dean. Well, this is exciting what ECNL is doing right now, and I really want to start with that, John, because you moved me the other day when you told me how you went about making your decisions, particularly during this COVID time, and ECNL fit the puzzle. Walk us through that, John. Yeah, so obviously our academy program has been a longtime member of what was the U.S. Soccer Development Academy for many years. And when it became kind of rumored that that was going to come to an end, what we tried to do was kind of think about the future for what we wanted our program uh, from a league standpoint to be involved in, but also take into account, you know, how our world was, you know, in terms of the uncertainty of, of travel and really kind of talk to the other clubs in our area within North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, in our region. And collectively for us, the ECNL made a lot of sense. A lot of the clubs already had teams and programs that were in, involved in ECNL, just like NCFC Youth. We've been involved in ECNL for quite some time. So we knew the league, we knew the program. We started dialogues with, with ECNL leadership and kind of collectively came to the decision that we wanted to maybe do away with flying 60 kids to Florida every other weekend and paying these astronomical prices and, and all that. And and like I said, due to the, to the COVID world, we were kind of transitioning into with the uncertainty, get back to you know regional games and, and good competition in our own backyard and that kind of thing. So the ECNL kind of developed into the to the idea that the Mid-Atlantic Conference that already existed would then welcome us and, and other former DA programs into the to the league. And we're really happy with it. ECNL pretty much wrote the book on how to deal with girls and their development to college and even to the pro leagues. How have they caught up on the boys' side, which is your main focus? ECNL Boys is still kind of comparatively a young league and young kind of program, but they had the blueprint for how they wanted to work with the girls. They did the same with the boys. They opened up that league a few years back. But I think the main difference for us coming in is that they've allowed the flexibility of each club and each program to, to still develop players and, and have their account for how each club wants to do it. For example, with us, we at the academy level feel it's, it's necessary to dedicate 10 months to the development of players and really stay in line with, with what we're doing on a week-to-week -week basis and so the players don't play high school from that. Obviously, our club offers into the ECNL program for those that do want to play high school. But anyway, I think ECNL, their leadership and, and as a league, they were able to be flexible and understand that, the, that not every club wanted to develop players the same way. And so they were able to help us manage and kind of the academy programs that were in the, the former DA come into the ECNL, still maintain a 10-month schedule and the programming that we wanted to. So we're, we're happy with it. And obviously, it's, it, it's a modified version of what it was going to be in terms of, of now kind of more and regional games, certainly this fall. And then we'll see what the spring looks like and see if the travel becomes a little bit more for us to get some more competitive games in, in Virginia and in other places. ECNL or not ECNL, I really do like your path, John Bradford. And 15 years at NCFC Youth, and then Dave Sarakin comes in. You're named the top assistant with Dave Sarakin. So now the true way that professional soccer should work and developing players is working, and you're a testament to that. Just talk about putting in that time and then seizing the day with this opportunity and what it means for you and your development. Yeah, and I'm lucky is what I am. You know, I think it's a combination of, of I've been with the club for so many years that I'm really fortunate that I've been able to kind of work at each level. So I understand how our club operates. So when I first started in 2005, I was coaching a, a U9 YTS is what it was called then. Now it's called Juniors. But I was coaching a U9 boys and a U9 girls team and then went on to be the director of that age group and then started with the U11 Classic and then became the boys classic director, was running camps for, for a number of years and then uh, evolved into uh, coaching a team within the academy and became the academy director and, and so on. And then 
you know, when Dave came in now almost two years ago, it was just a, an opportunity that, that was presented to me to say, okay, this club really wants to try to continue to develop the, the pathway from our top boys players into the professional environment. And so, you know, a lot of my job is obviously training and, and working with the first team on a daily basis for, for trainings and games, but also in the evenings, I'm out with, the, with our academy and, and making sure that our coaches are doing a great job and they all are. But then identifying those players, who do we want to bring into the professional environment and how will they cope with it? How will it help with, the, with their development, but really coming up with detailed plans for these, these high level individuals. So the club has allowed so many players to come in and have that experience and then continue to develop. So I think my role, you know, specifically is really just to help manage and provide opportunities for those that, are, that, are, that have earned it. Formerly Castle, now North Carolina FC Youth, arguably the biggest club in North America. As you've seen it evolve and other clubs have merged in, has it changed the dynamic of what you're all about at all? Uh, I think a little bit, yeah. I mean, I think when, when it was when it was solely Castle, it was, it was easier just to kind of focus just on what that club was doing, but there wasn't a professional outcome with Castle. And so I think, you know, between what was Castle, what was TFCA, and what was the Carolina Railhawks, when this collaboration all came together in, in 2015 and 16, it really was, you know, a, a culture-changing dynamic, which now brought at that time, the two biggest clubs together, which also meant the staff, you know, you, you, you got multiple guys with great experiences, great backgrounds, all working together. And then it added the element that was missing previously, which was that professional pathway on a true level to provide those players into the environment and all that. So I think, you know, from when I started in Castle 2005 to the evolution of where we are now in 2020, for players in our area, it's, it's a much more tangible and real opportunity for them to be in a great environment in the afternoons and, and weekends with the academy and then in the mornings with those that that are uh, given the opportunity to be training with the first team. Finally to turn it back to ECNL one of the things I liked about the approach with NCFC youth even when U.S. Stock was running the DA is if I understand it correctly and I think I do you guys did both you did ECNL and you did DA as Christian Labors has often said, it's a big country, and I feel like no matter what happens, even with MLS, NCFC youth will continue to want to participate between the men's side and the girls' side with the courage in ECNL in some form. I feel like that's pretty safe to say. What do you think, John? Yeah, I mean, for us, that was an, a, a decision that we made and we felt really confident in, you know, uh, the, for us to continue to play the good regional uh, opponents that we have played in the academy, gain some other ones that we enjoy playing from the ECNL that had already been in the ECNL league, and then, you know, continue to play MLS teams. If we were in a different league, we might be having to fly and travel almost every weekend. With the setup that we have now, we have a good schedule against good regional opponents. And then what we're doing is, is adding to it. So we're going to be playing the Atlanta Uniteds and, and Charlotte MLS and, and certain age groups throughout the year. And so even though those aren't in the league, it allows our players to compete against, you know, other high quality uh, academy programs. And then we cover our bases between playing good regional competition and MLS competition and, uh, and continue to get our players in front of scouts and college uh, coaches. We're pleased where we're at right now. And we're just looking to, to really dive into the league and do our best. All right, last question is just fill in the blank for John Bradford and NCFC Youth and the North Carolina Courage Academy programs right now. The ECNL means what to the club? Right now, I mean, it, it's, it's the highest level of competition we have within the club, you know, so it's the league that, that we are putting our best teams into, you know, and we've got two separate programs, our academy program and our what we call our ECNL program in there. And so we're all in in terms of the league and we're looking forward to how it evolves, the events and, and competing and trying to, trying to develop and win all at the same time. John Bradford, pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for joining us on Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Thanks for having me, Dean. And we thank John, as well as Amy Bracken and Holly Shoemaker from Hyperquake and Mike Cullina. For Christian Labors and all the great folks at ECNL, we'll see you in two weeks. From athletes just starting to turn heads to some of the best athletes to ever play their games, Gatorade shows that they are the proven fuel of the best. For the athletes who give everything, nothing beats Gatorade the studied, tested, and proven fuel of the ECNL. Thanks for listening to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. And if you have a suggestion for the show or a great idea for a guest, please email us at info at theecnl.com. Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast is an ECNL production. ECNL, more than a league.